Here's Jacob Nielsen's keynote speech from our UX conference in Las Vegas. Thank you, Aurora, and thank you, everybody, for coming here this evening. So anyway, I wanted to talk about a little bit of a broader perspective than what we, what we often cover, to so talk about more of a 25-year perspective. But I, what I will not do, this is not about giving kind of predictions for what the user interface will be like in 25 years or any of that type, because you can't really uh, predict that. And just by way of kind of illustrating that, uh, let's sort of take a look back, and I'll just take a look back to like you know, my beginning. So the day I was born, the day I was born, all the world's newspapers had the same headline. And that headline was not, you know, future <laughs> user experience specialist born in, in Denmark. Uh, the headline, the day I was born, all the world's newspapers was Soviet Union launches world's first artificial satellite. So I was one of the first space age babies on that first day of the space era. But the truth is that we, people called it the space age at the time. That's what they thought of as being the defining technology of sort of uh, the, the new modern era, I guess. And today, I don't think anybody would say we are living in the space age. I mean, we say we live in the computer age, much more so. On the other hand, when I was a kid growing up, you know, com we call computers electronic brains because they were these like w weird, humongous things sta sitting someplace and no normal person would ever go near one and they were only used by, by specialists. So that kind of shows you that a complete flip in perspective during that time, right? And so this is a kind of a why we don't want to say similar things now. Let's go even back further, um, 1898. So there was the first uh, urban planning conference held, International Urban Planning Conference in New York. And so what was the big problem of a day in urban planning that those guys were discussing at the conference? It was horse manure. <laughs> because that was a serious problem. In New York City, there was 100,000 horses to pull all different type of vehicles. In London, there was actually 300,000 horses. And when you stick, put 300,000 horses in a city, they leave behind, you know. Uh, their manure. And that's a health hazard and it smells and it's nasty and people step on it or whatever. Just very unpleasant. And to get rid of it, you send out like more horse-drawn carriages so you kind of exacerbate the problem and people shovel it up. And so that was a huge problem and yet just a few years later it was just gone. The last uh, horse-drawn cab was redrawn in New York in 1917. So just a few years later really this problem was gone. So it's very difficult to predict like exactly how the technologies will go and we might sort of get that wrong. So I'm not gonna do that. One of the other reasons I'm picking like 25 years is that that's the time where actually things could change. So for example, it took 20 years between the mouse being invented and it being in kind of common use in a popular computer device. And one of the reasons for that was that the first mouse, you know, Doug Engelbart was actually nice enough to let me kind of borrow his mouse and hold it and try it. And it's, it's, a, it's a very clunky, heavy device, not something you really would want to use on a normal basis to do, do like write an article or something like that. So it took 20 years between being invented and being in, in popular use. And that's another reason if we think about 25 years, there's some hope, you know, that, that something could happen. Um, but let's actually go and say, what, is, what can happen in a 25-year period? So 25 years ago, in user experience, actually the word, or the term user experience was actually invented 24 years ago. Don Norman came up with the term 24 years ago. But obviously, user experience existed before Don came up with that particular word for it. Uh, so it's an older discipline. Uh, but it was kind of very, still very young at the time. And the exact word is actually only 24 years old. Uh, 25 years ago, this is what I was working on. Um, I was working on, on tablet computing. And uh, at the time, you know, the tablet computer I was working on, we, I worked at a kind of a very fancy telephone company research lab, at Bell Communications Research. And the tablet cost 11 times what an iPad costs today. And so it was only really these rich labs that could afford it. And also, you can just see the way I'm holding it. This was a heavy thing, and so not something you would want to use in the public, but again, research 25 years ago, common day uh, use today. So 25 years is a good kind of horizon for hoping that things could actually happen. So let me talk about what I think are some of the challenges for our field that we want to solve over those next 25 years. 
The first one is knowledge, work, or productivity. Productivity is crucial to basically the wealth of nations, to our income, to our salaries, to everything, because any company that pays employees more than they produce, that company will go out of business. So you can't do that. You cannot pay people more than they produce. So if we want to kind of advance, we got to actually produce more. Now, that works wonderfully in older businesses like agriculture. I mean, there's such so few farmers left now, and they make more than enough food for all of us. They keep being better and better at doing farming. Or manufacturing, the assembly lines, they crank out more and more you know, gadgets, and, and that's improving too. However, those areas of industry or business are no longer the most important ones to the economy. The most important to the economy is really the knowledge work, which is kind of us, really. And we are not improving at any kind of rapid pace in how uh, much we can, we can do. And that is, to a great extent, the fault of computers. It's sort of a dual fault, a double fault. So one of the reasons is that people just waste endless time messing with their computers and being bogged down in problems. And so that's, of course, you're not producing while you are suffering you know, just bad design. But even more so, we don't even really know how to truly support creativity or decision making or advanced, uh, you know, advanced anything of knowledge work. Uh, I mean, we can hardly really uh, support kind of simple kind of budgeting or something like that. I mean, spreadsheets were invented quite a long time ago now, but anything better than that, uh, we're sort of sorely suffering. So this is, uh, this actually goes, I was mentioning Doug Engelbart before, the guy who invented the mouse, but that was his, his smallest project. His real project was augmenting the human intellect. And so he started that trend of saying, let's see if we can make computers make people really like knowledge work better. And sad to say, uh, he made a little advance, certainly, but I think today we're still not very far, and that's something we really need to, to work on. The other thing is uh, enabling the majority of the population to really be empowered by computers. So today it's the case that only about 5% of the population are able to do advanced things with computers, things that require real decision making or uh, compiling multiple sources of information or using any form of advanced features. The vast majority of people can only go through kind of simple linear steps, you know, scroll through timelines, kind of click add to, the, add to the shopping cart. I mean, they can do simple things, but they can't do any kind of advanced things. And so they're really kind of oppressed in reality by the computers or by the, by the companies that are putting out some of these products, and they don't have this kind of liberating ability to just make it into an empowering tool. And that's again because computers are too difficult and they're not designed for the way most people think and work. So we had a you know, full day course today uh, that Hua Lorenz taught about the human mind, and that's just not how computers are designed. They're designed possibly for the mind of those like few percent of, of top engineers and stuff, but they're not designed for the, for the broad public. And therefore, most people are really uh, entrapped by computers rather than being empowered by computers. And that's something we really uh, need to work on. We also need to work on uh, making better design for old users because we all live, uh, all kind of rich uh, countries are aging societies, rapidly aging societies. People live you know, longer and longer, which is certainly, you know, <laughs> it's better than the alternative. Um, but it does mean we have a lot of old people and we will have even more so old people in, in 25 years. And computers are not well suited for this aging population. Uh, a lot of design projects are aimed at, at young users. Very few are aimed at, at old people. There's a lot of, uh, we've done a lot of research with senior citizens and they do have you know, their own requirements and special needs and so forth. And that's not really being catered for in today's world. And so that's something we need to, to work on. Usable security. Um, it's like every week there's another scandal Another breakthrough, break, uh, break in, you know, millions of people's private information is being, you know, abused or, or released to the wrong, the wrong people. Uh, and this just is going to get worse. And the solution to that is not to make, like, even longer passwords with even more strange characters in them and make people change their password every month or every week. Because what happens is they're just going to have to write it down, right? Because going to go back to this thing about the human mind, people just can't remember those long, arbitrary uh, things. So what happens, you could go into like most offices and you can just pull out the drawer and you can see the password and a sticky note. 
And so we need to make the security such that it's, first of all, built throughout the system, not sort of a patched on thing, but secondly, also that it takes into account human nature, human factors, such, because most break-ins happen because of human uh, elements, not because somebody actually like cracked um, a, a code. I mean, it can be done, but that's not where most, most problems come from. Also, I want to say for the next 25 years, I think we want to really work on getting kind of proper user experience methodology to be pervasive in design everywhere. It's just a disgrace how much bad design there is in the world, um, how many usability problems we continue to meet again and again. And we know how to not have those bad things, but it's just not really being done. Uh, even those companies that do uh, f do some amount of, of, of sort of UX work often kind of do it wrong. They don't use at least sort of all the recommended methods. They might do some of them a little bit wrong and so forth. So we want to get kind of the full scope of, you know, that design thinking life cycle of all of the methodology, early focus on users, good usability testing, all of the, the entire range of things, pervasive. Um, and that again is a long, lo I mean, I've already worked for this, for <laughs> trying to push this for 30 years, or more than 30 years, so. I think another 25 years, but then we should get to that point. Okay, let's also talk though about some things that we maybe we can actually get through a little bit faster. So a uh, five year challenges. The first one is artificial intelligence. So that's, of course, right now kind of the hottest hot technology and, and uh, a lot of people are talking about it. And it's like any new technology. In the beginning, the products suffer from being driven by technology-focused design rather than human-focused design. And this is just one more of those. But I don't think it's something that we wouldn't be able to cope with if, if we or the companies that do AI products would, would focus more on using you know, our, our methods and, and, and focusing more on human-centered design. And I think that is going to happen uh, because otherwise these products will fail. So I'm pretty, pretty hopeful on that, but it's going to take the, uh, another five years or so before we really get good AI products. Also, we have the, um, the user interface is no longer just a computer screen. We have much more of a multi-device, with the full environment. We had a full day on omnichannel user experience here a few days ago, and that's the world we're going through. And, and so well, we did have a full day course on it, so we know a lot about how to do it. So that's again why I think that is a shorter term challenge, uh, but it definitely is a challenge because it's, it's much harder to design the full environment than just assign one user interface for one, one device. So it's not something that sort of just happens. You know, we've got to work on it, but, but we can do it. Big screens, I, I, I think it's just a disgrace how unempowered people are when they have a big screen. I mean, almost no software takes advantage of bigger screens. Uh, spreadsheets do. Uh, Bloomberg has some nice work on kind of trading platforms for, for um, finance sector for big screens. But there's very little work on how to really take advantage of the big screens. And there's a lot of work on how to design for small screens for mobile phones, which is great because we need to do that. Uh, but we also need to design for big screens. And it's not just take the little design and just make it big, 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 bigger. <laughs> well, if you have a bigger screen, you should be able to do more, not have the same small thing look really big. So, so that is a, such a waste. And going back to what I mentioned earlier, where we need to really improve, enhance knowledge, work, or productivity. And this is one of the ways in we can do it, is to show better dashboards, better information displays, and support this type of decision-making uh, behavior. Uh, but again, it's not just like, okay, let me just throw more numbers on the screen either. You've got to do it without overwhelming people, which is why it is a human factors challenge and not something that happens tomorrow, but I think we, we, can, we can do that. So I really would like, like to encourage, like, design for the big screen, design for the small screen, but also design for the big screen, particularly anybody who does uh, enterprise uh, style software. Also, it is time to make technology work, to stop accepting that it always crashes and freezes and does the wrong thing, and that's just another disgrace. Uh, if you think of something like uh, Microsoft Word, it's, it's now a 34-year-old product, and still 
You know, when you print, every now and then the, the picture goes in the wrong spot or there's some other, and it takes you hours to figure this thing out as opposed to just make the software do what it's supposed to do. And so that we really have to do. Um, I would actually, I would like to call for just a moratorium on new features for the next year, or maybe even two years. All the world's programmers, no new features, only fix the bugs <laughs> in what you already did. And I know it's so temp yeah, that's, <laughs> that's freeze, moratorium on new features and fix the thing you already did. And it's, but it's so tempting, you know, people really like this notion of, oh, the new glamorous fancy thing. It's like this kind of pop song, you know, I want some new face. <laughs> <laughs> and no, let's get stick to, the, stick to the old and make it work. And then once it works, then we can, it's time to try something new. Finally, as a five-year challenge, I like us to evangelize UX methodology. This is an easier challenge than getting all, all design products to really run right, but uh, we can definitely push for more acceptance, more understanding, not just lip service, but you know, a better use of, of user experience. So I think those are, those are things we can do in the next five years. Now, th a few things I did not mention that I could have mentioned, uh, the first one is uh, voice user interfaces, because I think that even though certainly, yes, that's another design issue, how to do that, uh, but honestly, it's really, whether it's voice or you just like type your command to the computer, it's just dialogue design. And so that is something we, can, we know how to do, and I think that's gonna be, I mean, of course it's work to do it. I'm not saying the guys who do the voice things or the Amazon Echo anything, that there's no work in designing those things, but I don't think it's sort of like fundamentally terrible. Autonomous cars is one of the big technology changes we're just about to have happen, and so that could have been potentially s something thought of as a big challenge, but I actually don't think so because I think the problem from a user interface perspective is pretty much already solved. Now engineering-wise, there's a lot of work, but that's not you know, our field. User experience-wise, honestly, when you think about like how Uber works today, it could as well be an autonomous car. I mean, they send you a car with a person with a steering wheel, but if that was a computer instead of a person, from the user perspective, the passenger perspective, the user interface would be about the same. So that's why I'm saying that, um, of course, it can get, get better. Anything can always get better, but it's already pretty good. So I think that we can have autonomous cars from a user interface perspective, and that's not a fundamental difficult challenge. Uh, actually, there's one thing I think there's an issue, which is, uh, scalability of the user experience. Because if you think about something like, you know, let's say kind of some, some kind of ball game, baseball game, whatever, and it's, it's over and like 50,000 people, they all stand up, they pull out their phone, they press the Uber button, and 50,000 cars arrive outside the stadium. <laughs> How are you gonna match up the 50,000 passengers with 50,000 cars? Now that is not something that we know how to do right now. That's in the, it will be issues of like, Again, the omnichannel user experience, the physical environment, total environment design. But you know, on the same time, they can get rid of all the parking lots. So they'll have some space to design that thing. Finally, driver distraction. This is something that actually I would have mentioned as a fundamental challenge if it was not for that middle bullet with autonomous cars, because there will not be any drivers in 10 years. Therefore, it's not a 25-year challenge to not distract the drivers since they just won't be there. But right now, it certainly is a big issue. So this chart here shows the number of people killed every year in traffic accidents in the United States alone. So worldwide, no, many, many more times. And so we can see that on the one hand, sort of the good news is it used to be 50,000 people killed per year, and then it went down to 35,000 for, for a while. But the last few years, it's gone back up by another 5,000. And so why has it gone back up? Because it's not as if people have stopped using seat belts or the cars, new cars that are made without crumble zones or anything like that, right? So no, it's driver distraction. It is smartphones. Smartphones are killing 5,000 people per year in traffic in the United States alone. Worldwide, probably more like 100,000. So this means that if you guys are working on a mobile app or mobile website, you've got to think about how many people you're killing. <laughs> um, because it's true, and it's sad, but it is true. So very short time, you know, that is a big problem. Long time, no, because it just won't, won't be the dri any drivers, human drivers. So here's a summary of, of what I mentioned here, uh, the short-term challenges and the longer-term challenges. What you'll notice is, 
at the bottom of both lists are user experience methodology. And the reason I list this there is that I think that's actually the solution to these other challenges, is if we really truly adapt um, our methodologies and use them deeply, I mean, again, it's, it, has, it has to be deep design, not just surface design, but if we do that, then that's the way we can solve uh, the other challenges. So I'm actually quite hopeful that in both a kind of a five-year horizon and a 25-year horizon, we will be able to do it. Now, to kind of sum up here, I want to sort of step back even more so and say, how far have we come in the UX field? And I think, to just give you kind of a rough number, I think we're only like 10% of the way there to where we should be in terms of user experience. Uh, and of course, a number like that you can look at in two ways, but right? <laughs> it's a positive and a negative way of looking at it. Negative is that despite so many years of working on it already, <laughs> we are only very short way of the way there to a good design. Uh, the positive way of looking at it is to say that's a good, we have a lot happy things to look forward to. <laughs> so let me look at, take the 100 year view of user experience. And so from 1950, which is sort of about when it started, till 2050. And what I'm doing here, I'm trying to sort of like quantify the growth of user experience by just one number, which is the number of UX professionals in the world, with maybe about 10 people in 1950, uh, who were mainly the people at Bell Labs who designed the touchtone phone. And by the way, that, des that design that those guys did, it's still what we're using today. And that just shows you the importance of getting the user experience right. Um, and they did a good job, luckily. Uh, those are some of the first, first uh, human factors people to turn their attention to interface design was at Bell, at Bell Labs. They did a good job of it. And what you can see if you pay close attention to this chart is that it really, the, the, the angle kind of is a little bit different in the middle, which is the, the 33 years that represents, um, or 34 years that represents my career from uh, 1983 till now. And it's not because it's my career, but it's because during that period, we had a few things happen that made user experience accelerate a boom, even more so than what happened in the beginning in the pioneering age, uh, also more so than I think is more realistic in the, in the future. And so the first one was the PC revolution. So when computers became personal rather than um, just only business, that meant that you had to design for normal people for average people to use the computer. And the person who bought the computer was also the user, and the person who bought the software was also the user. And so that made them actually want to buy good software, but as we know, it's an issue for a lot of enterprise software that the person or people buying it are not the same as people using it, and therefore often we get low quality in that sector. But in the personal computer um, arena, the same person buys it and uses it, and therefore they have, they have more motivation to get good quality of the, of the design. Um, and so that was, that was like really a lot of growth in, 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 those, in those years in the 80s. Uh, the second thing was the web revolution uh, starting kind of in the mid-90s, and that is maybe even more so, because one of the big differences between the PC era and the web era is that for personal computers, you know, let's say you go, you go and buy Excel and you take it home and you install it, and then you discover you cannot make a pie chart. But by the time you discover you cannot make a pie chart in Excel, Bill Gates already has your money. Because for PC software, it's first you pay the money, and second you have the user experience. Now on the web, we reverse that sequence of those two. Because on the web, first you have the user experience. Right? First you, s you go to the home page, does that even make any sense? Can you navigate the site? Can you find the thing you want? You want? Can you uh, use the shopping cart? Can you check out? If yes to all of those questions, if it's actually well designed for every step of the way, then you give them money. So on the web, user experience first, give them money second. And that, of course, makes UX come up front, become higher visibility for business, and more investment in our field. So that was the second reason for higher growth in, in this time period. And the third one is, I think particularly during the dot-com bubble, we had a lot of kind of positive PR around usability as well. It was kind of like a new 
feel. It wasn't really new because it goes back to the 1950s, but it was new in the public eye. It was new that it was sort of big and being talked about, and businesses would care about it. A lot of management and executives would kind of say, oh yeah, this thing we heard about, we better get some of that here as well, and all of that. So uh, that was sort of another boost we got. Uh, but, but honestly, uh, we can't really expect that to continue to be, to be true all of the time, right? But because of that, I would say that during my time in this field, when I started, there was maybe about a thousand people in the world doing user experience. So, and, and now there's uh, probably about a million, you know? So that is a fast growth rate in that, uh, that 34 year period. And, and actually we, uh, we trained about 50,000 of those guys just here at these events. Uh, and of course, many, many other people uh, helped all the other guys get going as well. So now you may think, that you don't necessarily personally experience this kind of very fast growth rate I've just been talking about. But that's because the growth of UX is really uh, takes place in three arenas, and only one of them is that you can personally experience. So the first one is growth inside your company. So you, your company is gonna hire some more UX people. And that you, can, you, you definitely see. But the second one is more companies are doing user experience, Ev all the time new companies do it. You can just look at the attendee list for this conference and see so many different industries, so many companies sending people here that would not have done so five years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, but that you don't see. If you don't work in these other companies, you don't know that they are increasing their, their UX uh, spending and the UX people. And the third way in which UX is expanding, which is maybe even more so, is number of countries where there's uh, user experience work being done. Because it used to be just a little handful of kind of ad, ad, uh, the most advanced countries that, that did it uh, when I started. But today, I mean, just actually at this year at the UX conference, we have had people from 74 different countries attend here. 74 different countries. And, and last year it was 60, 69, so it's five more countries just this year. You know. <laughs> But again, if you don't live in those countries, if you don't live in, let's say, Kazakhstan, where we had some people come to London, if you don't live there, you don't know that they have a <laughs> though their budding UX community in those countries. So that's the third growth rate. So we have growth in all these arenas and put together, you know, worldwide, which is what I'm talking about here, we really have had uh, amazing growth and I think it, it's gonna continue, but a little bit slower rate. Now, this chart, is on a logarithmic scale, which I know that people have a hard time dealing with, but that's the only way we can summarize that big a change over a 100 year period in one picture. Now, we don't live in a logarithmic world, right? we live in a linear world, so I'm gonna show you the same, uh, same data on a linear scale, and so this is how it looks. So basically, from the foundation start of user experience until now, we're just like hugging, creeping along on the x-axis, and we are just about, in if like in maybe 2020 or so, about to sort of have the curve break and move up and move really up. And that's what happens to these kind of growth rates, that once they really get going, you know, this, the, the, the absolute change, rate of change, is it, the change is very, very high. And that's what I really uh, will, is predicting will happen. So uh, I think to, to any of you who are just sort of new in, uh, in user experience, you have this uh, kind of rocket ride ahead of you. Well, this field is gonna be really big. Now, you notice that I'm predicting here that uh, by, by 2050, we'll have 100 million UX professionals in the world. That's 1% of the world's population. So is that, am I just going crazy here and you're being too optimistic about our field? And um, I, th I think not, because I think honestly, it's, it's very reasonable that 1% of the population are find, s think about what should be done and the 99 of the people do it, you know? But there needs to be people who figure out what should be done and design it and, 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 fi and, and do the research. And particularly if we go back to this point about, about knowledge, worker productivity and, and supporting old people and these various bigger challenges that are the things that will be driving the economy going forward. I mean, the economy has been very stagnant in all which countries for the last several years. And to a great extent, it is because of kind of the lack of, of good UX and lack of really understanding of how to support, to make computers support knowledge workers. So I think it's completely a, a realistic possibility that we can go and have the have you know that many people worldwide because uh, because we need them and it will completely pay for itself and the other 99 percent of the population will just be happy that finally you know technology is going to work so uh, that's my prediction for the future that 
as the saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's just like the, the last 70 years of user experience, that's nothing. And the next 30 years, that's it. And uh, so I think it's going to be great, and I think we are going to make the world so much better. Thank you very much. Thank you.